For as long as humanity has existed, a war has been waging for power and position. Leaders come and leaders go, but the story stays the same. Promises are made, camps are created, division sets in, and it always ends in a stalemate. But as broken as the world's systems may be, we know that there's no authority except from God. So what does God look for in a leader? What kind of king does God bless? What type of kingdom is he building? All right. Eric, you want to flip the dance floor lights back on? Um, so I'm excited for this new series we're going to enter in, and we're going to get into it. Uh, I set out to accomplish a little bit more than I am going to be able to today, but uh, today we get the joy of uh, going Old Testament, uh, and you've probably heard me say it before, though, when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to God's Word, um, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. Uh, scripture doesn't change over time. Um, what God said or is saying to the people then in the Old Testament is what he's saying to people now. Um, the same is true for people then as the same is, is true for us today. And, uh, and, 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 and really said that what was true for them is true for us today as well. Today as we start this new series uh, focused on the Old Testament, Kings and Kingdoms, um, we're going to uh, look at the backstory. Uh, we're going to actually start in Genesis and get all the way up to Chronicles uh, in hopefully a quick amount of time. But a lot of our content comes out of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, and First and Second Chronicles. Uh, but like I what I said, the Old Testament uh, books uh, to people of that time were equally equally written for us today. For us to experience and uh, unpack. Uh, and so what I want to do, what I'm going to try really hard to do, is give you like a flyover of the history to get us to the point where kings and kingdoms began uh, formally in the Bible. Um, an Old Testament history lesson. How many of you are still in some sort of schooling right now? Dan, I know you are. You're not raising your hand. Okay. So it's been a while since you've gotten a history lesson in a history class, but today you're going to get a little one. But I want, what I want you to do is throughout this uh, historical account that will get us to the point, there is, there is some overarching ideas that I'm going to point out uh, that ring true from Genesis all the way even through the New Testament uh, about us, about God's people, about who God is. And so I'm going to insert those in there, and I want you to listen for those as we, as we do that. So it all started in Genesis in the garden. God creates man, gives him tasks. Then he creates women, and together they uh, interact with God. And together they decide, at that moment, they want more. And so Genesis 3, we attempt to disrupt order, and sin enters the world. Thus, the struggle for power and control begins, countering trust and faith. Then knowing the flood to reset everything, uh, but not to eliminate the struggle as it continued, uh, the covenant that God said he would never do that again, and that even then through the line of Abram or Abraham, as you probably know him, he would bless all people on earth foretelling, and this is speaking of Jesus, foretelling of Jesus that through Jesus he would bless all the people. Furthermore, then went on to some stories of deceit and moral decay, and we run into Isaac and Jacob and Esau's struggle for power and selfish control. These are all stories. If, you, if something sticks out, go back and read it. I can't unpack each of the stories, but if you've been around church for a while, you probably know. Um, but that's the bell that I'm going to ring throughout this, is that power and humility and um, our struggle and wrestling with that common themes, Joseph and his brothers, the story of jealousy, but yet again it stabs at power and control and a lack of faith. And it's our opportunity to learn from the past in these things. 
And then we go into Egypt and the exile and Moses and the plagues. God's people led out of the, 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 the captivity. Then a covenant with God and into the promised land. Then yet a demise again of the allegiance to God through following his covenant. They decided that it wasn't good enough and that they needed more. That yet at that time, escaping the Egyptian army and the millions of people that had escaped, we see the fall of many great men. But like Abraham, we probably know a guy named David. And to spoil kind of how that works, but we're going to get into it a little bit more. Uh, we're going to look at the lineage and the line of David, that one true king, that King Jesus, Christ the King, would come out of his line. But that it wouldn't come at a massive upheaval of power or strength, not out of a mighty earthly foundation of, of, of mass and power. But church, what rings true throughout all of Scripture and many, many, many of the stories throughout Scripture is that God starts with the humble. God starts with the lowly. He starts with the barren. Those that have very little to offer. And in a sense, we see in the book of Samuel where that starts. It starts with the prayers of a single barren woman who gives birth to the first prophet, Samuel. Samuel was the first prophet, prophet and he... he called and anointed and it, prophet i'm going to say it a couple different times but prophets aren't people that would foretell the future as much as they were the mouthpiece for god they would speak the truth of god in actuality we'll get into it a little bit they would actually call people out to follow the truth of god but hannah samuel's mom writes a poem in first samuel chapter two and she writes this poem stating that we are to delight in the lord that she is delighted in the Lord that she has given birth to this son. And that from that birth and from what is to come from that birth, that we would not be prideful, that there would be no arrogance, that those that are keeping in step, those that are low, those that are hungry would hunger for more and saying that the Lord is in control and he determines the outcomes. And for us, I think we would, it would be hard to be so arrogant to think that we are in control. But I think if we, if we really think about it, that's what we strive for often, is to be in control. Samuel, the prophet, again, he rises up to be a great leader uh, as, as, uh, as a life as a prophet. Again, not to tell the future, but to speak on behalf of God to God's people that he was the mouthpiece of God. And God's people, the Israelites, would then grow prideful even again. They would lose a battle to the Philistines, and yet again they would lose track of their humility and their obedience to God's command. And Samuel would continually remind them. And at this point, after the loss of the battle, they come to Samuel and they say, it is our desire to have a king. And Samuel said, no, it says in Scripture, knowing their hearts and their reason for it, he was, um, he was uh, disappointed. But he goes to God and he prays, and God says, equally so, I know, but in a sense, give them what they want. 1 Samuel 8, 6 through 9 says, But when they said, give us a king to lead us, it dis displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all the people. Listen to what all the people are saying. It's not that they have rejected you, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done for, from the day I brought them into Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing, uh, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. What 
we see and what we will continue to see in this series and, and more today is that when we follow and build and establish things on our own, oftentimes, way more times than not, we find ourselves in a position that is displeasing to God. Mainly because we've just done it on our own. And oftentimes we say that we work hard for the plans that we have put out in front of us. We had a discussion this morning on whether this is in the scriptures or it's a paraphrase, but Man plans his steps, or something to the effect of, we plan our steps, but God determines our direction. And as a first king, Samuel then uh, calls, or as a first uh, prophet, he calls the first king Saul. Not Paul Saul, but Saul, different Saul. Uh, dishonest, he's a bad character, and he's very prideful. And opposing what God has been asking of his people. And Saul disobeys God's commands directly. And it says that God is grieved by what he is doing. Humble and faithful, Samuel remains, uh, reminds the people in, in, in God uh, and, and dethrones Saul in the process but he begins by uh, naming his uh, replacement. And at that point, Saul's pride takes over and a lowly, insignificant, nothing to offer shepherd boy David, humbly trusting God, and God elevates him, first as a general to win battles for Saul, but then into um, his king, much more than Goliath, where he defeated Goliath in his rise. David does one thing that plays quite significant in his rise in humility not much to offer he unifies God's people instead of tribes he brings them together to form what would be one kingdom one kingdom that would follow after God God says I have a plan for you and and David receives the most significant promise from God at that time. 2 Samuel 7, From your line will come a future king that will be set forth for an eternal kingdom. So as David sets up a physical kingdom, unifying people together through God's promise through David, sets up an eternal kingdom. God's kingdom. And if you remember the promise of Abraham that God gave him is that all the people would be blessed from Abraham's line. This meets up with David's promise. And that everyone would be, uh, that a king would come from David's line, his lineage. And now we see at this point, most likely David's pride takes over, gets the best of him. And you, if you've been around church at all, you've probably heard the story of David and Bathsheba and their hookup. And then David kills Bathsheba's husband by sending him to the front lines of the war. And at that time, a prophet named Nathan um, that delivers God's uh, words to David, his voice to David, rebukes David, and David humbly accepts and admits to his shortcomings in his fall. But what's interesting here is that David's son seemingly repeat the sin of David. And it reminds me of how often our sins affect way more than ourselves. That our pride, that our shortcomings, that our fall... Is way more than just a conversation with us and God. And Tamar and Amnon and uh, Absalom go on to uh, carry out David's sin in their lives. But the promise of the true king comes true. Now, we're almost done here. 
old man David hands off to Solomon yet again, and we see David hand off the call after all that he's been through, after all that he's humbled himself to. He hands off the call to Solomon. And what's recorded in Scripture, David says, stay faithful and humble to God. Those are the two things that he instructs, Sol instructs Solomon to do. And Solomon, in that actually at the beginning of his reign, asks for God's wisdom. Church, can I encourage you that that is one thing we should all be doing? Asking for God's wisdom in all things that we face in our lives. And so you would think Solomon starts out great, asking for God's wisdom, but it's not too long into his reign that he shifts his reign into politics and power, and he marries numerous women for the alliance of power to build his kingdom. And then, he then establishes the worship of, worship of even false idols and gods uh, into uh, this kingdom that David had set up, this God's kingdom, building up huge wealth and power in an army, and what's laid out for kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon seems to break almost everything in the commands of God that is written in Deuteronomy 17. And then we see the people divided, divided over taxation and leadership. Are we headed into a season where that might be true today? A northern kingdom over Jerobo uh, under Jeroboam, uh, nor in the north of Israel In that kingdom The northern kingdom Builds up uh, a couple extra temples To rival God's kingdom That is built at that time And then the southern kingdom Judah Which I learned on Thursday morning Ben taught me Judah means praise right We sang a song this morning That what does praise do Praise drives out our enemies And fear in our, and, and it, 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 it humbles us right and when we praise something above ourselves, it does that. And Judah, the name of that southern kingdom, means praise. Capital Jerusalem with God's temple at the center of it, full of kings from David's line. And if you need reminder, it's from that line of David that the messianic king would come, promised from Jesus. In the books of First and Second King, we look at both kings and kingdoms, and imagine that no king worthy comes out of that northern kingdom, and only eight of the twenty kings mentioned in our Bible out of Judah get the high remarks of God's rule. And so this morning, I would like to challenge you as we look to those kingdoms, as we look at what, what it is. And this is where it starts. Overarching the book of Kings, we see God using alongside these kings the prophets again to remind the people, not as one to predict the future, but as one to speak on behalf, to keep in step with God, and we see, even though only the people we mentioned today, Hannah and Samuel and Saul and David and Solomon, the kings, and then the, the stories and chronicles that we'll look at where we'll look at kings like Ahab and Jehoshaphat and Uzziah and Hezekiah and Josiah. And we see that their continued quest and struggle to follow our God and to be humble. That overarching the story is to be faithful to God and his instruction, his direction, and to be humble and not allowing pride to creep in, but allowing pride to fade away. So I want to ask you this morning, where, where and when was the last time you were humble? 
Where was the last time that you allowed yourself to display humility? If you're like me, you couldn't think of a spot. You couldn't think of the last time. That you were, tr- not like you did something good for somebody, or that you, uh, you know, helped out, but that you were actually humble. That you elevated something fully above yourself. That you humbled yourself underneath something. As I read all through all of the kings that we could focus in on in the story of basically almost reading the entire Old Testament over the last two weeks, it was so clear to me how present that struggle for humbleness and humility was written in just about every single page and every single story. And for me, it got me to the point where the ex- well, first, it caused me to strive for it. But more so than that even, it got me excited at the opportunity. If it's such a big struggle for man, and if I'm honest with myself, same struggle for me, how much my relationship with God and, 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 and what he desired for my life would change if I would take on what seems to be even a a very hard action. Humility and humbleness. But that if I focused in on that, I would be able to gain so much glory for God's kingdom and work for him to to, uh, accomplish in my life. And so for us, I think as we look at these Old Testament characters, and what I often try to uh, display when I am using characters and stories throughout the Bible is it's so easy to often say, well, I want to be more like David or more like Peter or be like Paul or be like the friend that carries my friend on a mat to Jesus' feet, right? Right? Or I don't want to be like David, or I don't want to be like Saul, or Judas, or Ahab, who we'll look at next week. And oftentimes that's, that's somewhat of a distraction for us, because ultimately what the example that is displayed in the stories and the characters, even of these Old Testaments, is to be more like Jesus, to be more like God, for God's call on our life, and those can distract us. But in this case, in the study that we're going to be looking at, I want us to take example of the struggles and the wrestling matches that happen for us to then focus in on what God wants to tell us through the story. And I'm confident that the stories of these kings and kingdoms that were built up are there for that reason. For God's people forward from that time to look at those stories and learn from the past what we might be able to experience and be a part of in God's kingdom today. And so I want for us to be prayerful and learning about what these kings that we're going to be looking at and the overarching ideas of staying humble before God and following his commands, which is overarching through it all, but also in certain ways. And what I'm going to do today is we're going, to, we're going to just introduce the king of Jehoshaphat. We're going to see a little tiny glimpse of Jehoshaphat. And then next week, we're going to look at Jehoshaphat and his interactions with Ahab. But 2 Chronicles 17, 3 through 6, I think it's going to be up on the screen. It says this, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of of his father David before him. That David in his life actually aided in the choices that he made, aided Jehoshaphat in his life. He did not consult uh, the, the idols of Baal, 
And, uh, but he sought God, his father, and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. So he followed, he was, uh, he followed the ways of his David. He followed the commands of the Lord. And the Lord established the kingdom under his control. Can we be a church that continues to establish the kingdom of God? That we don't build our own kingdoms. That we don't build our own kings and kingdoms in our lives that take the spot of an idol or our focus and attention. But can we be ones that build and establish the kingdom of God? It says, And all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so that he had great wealth and honor, and his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. So he followed the Lord's command. We devote ourselves to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places of the Asherah poles from Judah. He removed everything that would be above his God so that he could focus in on his commands. Here's what I believe will happen, church. If we take this opportunity to look at the kings and kingdoms of God, we really do this, we will find a way for ourselves to not only be used by God through our faithfulness and our humility of putting him above ourselves, but we also begin to recognize in our own lives, in the world around us, the ways of this world and how our own pride is established by what we establish in our lives, what we build, what we uh, place in those kingdoms and kingdom spots. And my hope is for you is that you've maybe even already thought of some of those things in your life that you've built up of high importance. At times, maybe slightly higher than God, maybe astronomically higher than following the Lord and his will and his commands in your life. But that then maybe we would recognize in our own lives and we wouldn't be disappointed because I think that this plays a lot of the role in it, that we would just be disappointed by the functions of this world and how 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 the functions of this world fall fall so much shorter than God's intended purpose in our lives. That anything we would try to build in this world fall, fall far shorter than what God would desire for our lives. I'm going to invite the band to come forward. And I want to leave you with that idea. The idea of, as we are at a point in time where the world occupies so much of our lives, so much of our focus, even, even the, the, the greatest things of this world are far shorter than what God would intend for us to enjoy. They fall flat in comparison to, the, to what God offers each one of us in our lives. And I think we'll begin to see that as we look at Jehoshaphat and Ahab next week. As we look at kings like Josiah and Hezekiah. And, and we unpack the ways and look at how when it comes to life and the struggles that we face, it's, it is nothing new. That God has led so many people through it. And he continues to rule and reign as we allow him to. Amen. Lord, we give you the rest of this morning. We thank you for your desire for our lives. We thank you that all throughout history, you have you stayed with us. Lord, throughout my own life, you have stayed with me, despite, despite me. 
So, Lord, right now, as we focus our attention on you and our desires, hopefully, on you, Lord, that you would enter into our hearts and our minds in the rightful place where you rule and reign over everything else. And that when it's all said and done, Lord, that we are so focused in on you, everything else makes so much more sense. And that your glory is present in all things. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a couple songs.